Mr. Minister, you spoke. Let me start from where you ended. Now, yes. uh, I'm sure that you're aware of uh, criticism of the Iraqi government's position vis-a-vis uh, -vis Syria. In effect, there is, there's been more than one editorial saying, what are you doing? You're letting the Iranians violate a Security Council resolution, fly weapons and aid, military aid to Syria from your territory or pass through your territory, which means that you would be in contravention of the Security Council resolution in support of what is considered a man who is uh, 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 the president of the United States called the dictator of Damascus. What are you doing? Okay. Let's, uh, let's separate two things. All right. First, the Iraqi position yeah. or the Iraqi government position it does not send or support Syrian dictatorship, uh, neither by money, arms, or oil. I mean, these are the three things that they most desperately need. Secondly, uh, there could be some overflight from Iran uh, to Syria. As everybody knows who follow the Middle East, both countries have enjoyed very deep, extensive relationship. And these flights before, actually, this one were authorized between Iran and Syria over Iraqi territories. But we have requested from the United States, from Western intelligence, to provide whatever hard evidence they have in order to be able to stop, to inspect, mm -hmm. uh, to ground this, this plane in order to verify what is in their cargo. Still, we have not had that. But you stopped Second, the flight they, recently, I know, right? No, we haven't stopped. We diverted, Korea, diverted, right. we diverted because we suspected of a North Korean flight going to Syria without any uh, uh, protocol, let's say, of flight. In fact, we, we stopped that. And for the Iranian also, there is a, a decision that they must be inspected and this has to be stopped. Third point, as we see a number of uh, uh, military people here who, who, who know these things better. West point, than, no less. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Uh, Iraqi defense systems are still nascent, really. They are not well developed. After the withdrawal of American forces and troops, still Iraq doesn't have a viable air force. We are trying to buy F-16 from the United States and other systems in order to enhance our defense capabilities. But uh, we are not there yet. Yeah, so so you, you're saying you don't have the capability to do what you have to do? We don't have the capabilities to do and what so, we and do the Iranians or to are deter. Getting, uh -huh, and the Iranians may, may be going ahead and doing, you know, taking advantage. Or is this, uh, as it's said, in coordination with the uh, government of your prime minister, Mr. Mali? No, no. I think the government does not endorse that, I can reassure you. And I, as the foreign minister, have formally requested that any such illegal flight or illegitimate flight should be stopped. Did you say to the Americans, why aren't you taking the Iranians uh, to task if you know that they are defying Security Council resolution uh, without you know, laying, it, laying the blame on you? If that's the case. Well, this is not the forum to <laughs> reveal all my cards or secrets. <laughs> it is the forum to reveal all your cards and secrets. No, but if any country is very passionate about this to put an end, I think they have the means, the tools, let's say, to, to disrupt it. And they haven't yet. I don't think so. All right. So, uh, let me ask you about, uh, uh, you are uh, the presidency of the Arab League for, the year, for, for this yes. year. And so, uh, a member of the Arab League, Qatar, yesterday in front of the General Assembly of the United Nations said, it's time to intervene in Iraq. And he spoke of an Arab in intervention. Um, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. In, uh, and, uh, uh, he said, uh, no, 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 no,
Uh, has this been discussed uh, with you as uh, the presidency? What is your reaction to it? Do you think it is just throwing a hot balloon or is this a serious matter? Yes, we had an, an Arab foreign minister meetings today. It was never raised uh, at the formal meeting. Uh, <coughs> the idea behind this that the Arab an Arab peacekeeping force should be sent to Syria is not new. He said intervention, not I peacekeeping. Know, I know, but that is what, I mean, the Arab forces will not go there and fight the Syrian army. But what is behind it, they want this to induce other countries to contribute uh, in this endeavor. But uh, really, it, I don't know how serious it is, to be honest with you. You see? Uh, I mean, everybody is concerned to put an end, but everybody believes that whatever intervention, there has to be through uh, the Security Council uh, sure. authority or under Chapter 7 regulations. Which is so impossible would, as long as the Russians it, and the it Chinese would be feel the way they do. Very difficult to pass such a, res a resolution under the circumstances. So is it in effect, I mean, it's really depressing what I heard you say and what you're saying now. Is the word saying to the Syrians, drop dead? Literally? N not really. I mean, this is not, I think, it's morally <coughs> wrong to drop the Syrian people. Uh, and we, and even the Iraqi position has been with the legitimate Syrian people rights for freedom, for democracy, for choosing their own government, for <clears throat> deciding their own destiny uh, without any interference by whoever. Mm. But uh, the circumstances have changed a great deal. I mean, when the NATO intervened in, in Libya, uh, I remember I was at the meeting with the world leader, and Iraq then also was the president of the Arab League, and we called on the international community to protect the Libyan civ uh, civilians. Um, I give this example to show when there is a will, there is a way. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there was a resolution by the key leaders uh, in NATO to do something, to stop the killing of Libyan by Gaddafi's uh, troops or brigades. So we were at the meeting with Sarkozy, with Merkel, with Secretary Clinton, and many others, when some of our Arab colleagues tried to question the language of the final communique to call on the international community to use all means, including military, that this is a too strong word. Mm -hmm. So Sarkozy responded. He said, it's too late to change the communique because our planes are already flying over Benghazi. So you think, you're saying that, you that the Syrians do not have a Sarkozy anywhere? No, no. Is this because... Nobody is, there, is, is taking... Is there... so, nobody is taking the lead. Whoever, it could be Sarkozy, it could be Obama, it could be Cameron, it could be... Putin. And why? I think because of this change conditions. I mean, you have been a veteran observer and journalist and reporter here. You've seen many, many crises. The situation has changed. Go ahead. Has changed. Now, here in the United States, I don't think there is an election season. Any president will dare to take any such decision. Is it elections and Europe, related, you mean? No, I mean domestically it's related, some of these decisions. Mm -hmm. the, in Europe, there is a financial crisis. Everybody is busy and worried and occupied by that. We've seen Turkey have raising the rhetoric to imminent intervention and no-fly zones, and nothing has come out of it. In effect, so in the conditions now are not ripe, are not ready. Mm -hmm. And we're talking this from experience. Right. The first no-fly zone, the first... Was in Iraq. Was in Iraq. Right. And we followed that 
since 91. So you think Bashar al-Assad is going to stay in power for an endless Not necessarily, time. not necessarily. But now the situation has reached a level. He's been weakened. He's, he's isolated. The great majority of the Syrian people are against the regime. Never again the relations of, of uh, the regime will be rectified with its people. It has been ruptured, so it cannot govern as was. It is a question of time, how long he will stay in power. But nobody should underestimate the capabilities of this regime to continue to last, let's say, or to reach a standstill. Do you know what the well, Russians by that, want that when... neither side will be able to win and the killing could continue the suffering, the, the displacement of people, the flow of refugees. Do you know what the Russians want? Because they have been so adamant in preventing the Security Council to act. But they want something from the Americans. They, it's not only a foothold in the region. What is it that they want that they have not gotten to the extent that they're going as far as they are? Bloody as, 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 of a trail as it's really dry. You see, the, um, one of the key factors that drives the Russian, their concerns and worry about uh, Islamic fundamentalism, extremists, to spread to their southern republic. But this the, is. But that's happening this, more by, know, by making it longer. No, no. This is an a long-held imperial position, mm -hmm. their belly, let's say, with the Muslim. Although now in, in Russia, there are 90 million Muslim people mm -hmm. living there. And also we've seen the Chech in Chechnya, in Dagestan, in other republics, mm -hmm. we see that there has been some serious problem. So uh, th there is a concern, actually, that these new regimes or this new movement they have taken power, mostly are influenced by Islamists, by Salafists, by jihadists, who could pose a threat to, to their interests and to others. Mm -hmm. And recent demonstrations in, in the regions try to convey that message. You see, that this is not what we have invested, in fact, in this society in order to to, to get this kind of a regime. But this is a temporary. I think this will fizzle out hmm. uh, with the focus on institution building, with the enhancing the democratic culture in the society. I think uh, that will be true. Your other neighbor, Iran, every now and then we, f we hear that, you know, the, ex the, the rhetoric is so tough between, or coming from Israel, uh, I should say, that people are expecting military strike. Others are saying it's not going to happen. Some believe that the Israelis are going to set up. They are setting up the Americans to do it, to strike. Uh, President Obama was yesterday uh, in the General Assembly of the United Nations, and he said, again, he repeated, uh, probably a, an unprecedented position by an American president who said, and, and as I said, he repeated it, that they, he would never allow a nuclear Iran. He is committed not to allow a nuclear Iran. How, how does that translate itself? If containment is over, and if there is such a pledge, what do you see coming? Well, this position is not new. I mean, yes. President he repeated Obama it yesterday. and uh, the administration have been saying this. And everybody is, is concerned about this, definitely. And we've been saying that nobody would be more concerned than Iraq because of the history, because of the relation. So we are the one country that I fear most of all of any nuclear Iran. And so the whole neighborhood, the whole uh, Gulf region. Uh, and the Iranians have been consistent in maintaining that they have a program, but it is for peaceful purposes. And it's their right to use nuclear energy for peaceful purposes how to verify that, how to be transparent, how to come clean on that. I mean, this is the work of the IAEA, of other inspectors. Uh, Iran is a signatory to the non-proliferation agreement, and it has to be responsible to allow inspectors. But this tension is real. Yes. 
It's not just uh, rhetorical. In fact, uh, Israel feels that its, its existence is threatened by such a prospect, or it is an existential threat to them if Iran would go nuclear. Uh, the Iranians believe that they have every right to develop their, their program uh, for peaceful purposes, for cancer treatment, let's say, for uh, many other projects that uh, nuclear power is, is used these days, or for electricity. So uh, we in Iraq hosted uh, recently a meeting on this, and it was for me, an eye-opener, really. The five-plus-one meeting with Iran mm -hmm. to discuss... This is the five uh, permanent members of the Security that's Council. That's correct. Plus uh, to Germany. To discuss Iranian nuclear program and prospects. And I found, actually, after two days of discussion, that there is a willingness on both parts to keep talking. I mean, to continue this dialogue to find a solution or a resolution. Of course, the gap between what the West wants and what the Iranian wants is wide open, OK? And some people believe this year is the immunity zone. If nothing You mean this happens, year as in the, from here till the end of the year? Yes, is the immunity zone. If nothing happens, they can cross the threshold and they will be safe to, to, to move ahead with, with their program. So you're not so, worried, mm -hmm. go ahead. So this is why you see this increased statement or aggressive statement coming out of Israel or even from the Iranian who threatened yesterday that they will start mm -hmm. a preemptive strike if, if they feel that they are threatened. We are the thick of it, we in, in Iraq. So you talk about use of Iraqi mm. uh, airspace. Yeah. In fact, once I joked with the, my Iranian counterpart when they were showing pleasure that the American will withdraw at the end of 2011, and uh, we said, but this is bad news for you. I said, why? I said, because we don't control our airspace, so you may get a strike from Israel over Iraqi airspace. <laughs> so, <laughs> as long yeah. as they were here, yeah. they were in control, they were preventing such possibilities from, from happening or taking place. Uh, and this is real life we're talking. Iraq won't be damaged badly if, if there is any confrontation. 80% of our oil exports go through the Gulf, okay? And we are dependent on this revenue for the sustainability of, of uh, our country. Let me ask you a very direct question, and you have to promise me a real uh, direct answer, and uh, you, are forgiven. you will be forgiven whatever the answer is. Okay. Uh, is it, uh, would you like to stay with us when, while I bring Amira Yahyawi and Farah, At Farah Atasi? Please, yes. All right, yeah. good. Then, yeah. and then the minister will stay with us. Please ah, come wa join us. Yes. Please, Farah, come Farah. join us. This is Farah Atasi. Ah, wa ah, 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 very nice. And this is Amira ah, Yahyawi. Uh, Farah Atasi uh, is Washington-based. Uh, she heads uh, a women's organization called uh, uh, NUSWA, which is the National Syrian Women um, Association. And uh, uh, she is a very active person in the opposition. Amira Yahyawi came all the way from Tunis. Amira Yahyawi came all the way from Tunisia. She is 27-year-old activist. Her whole life has been uh, an activist uh, before the revolution or before the evolution, however you want to say, in Tunisia. Revolution. Now she definitely, so it's up to her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, uh, you know, uh, Amira is very much involved in uh, uh, following and watching constitution processes in uh, Tunisia in particular. We may even get uh, probably a namudaj, as they say, a model. Uh, for that, uh, for the whole Arab region, it's Bosala, uh, the name of the organization that you have established. And I want to welcome you to New York to begin with. Since we've been doing Syria, 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 let's just listen to you a little bit about how, how disappointing or comforting has this revolution been for you? 
can be disappointing for me. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I was banned from my country for years, and um, I passed through many problems because of uh, the dictatorship. So even if it's not really the uh, the perfect um, government or the perfect uh, situation I can dream of, I'm still happy because I see that we can still change things. So that's one. Uh, second thing is... Um, it's very difficult to speak about Tunisia after Syria. This reminds me of um, speaking about Tunisia while people were speaking about democracies two years ago. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really difficult. But anyway, I hope when I give my inputs in Tunisia that you take it as an example, even if it's bad, <laughs> but an example of maybe what Syria will go will pass through in some years and hopefully one year. So uh, we are uh, drafting. Uh, we just drafted our constitution. The project has been published one month uh, ago. It's a very bad project. Very, um, how can I say, paternalistic constitution. We know you better than you are, and. We are so um, worried about your identity that we need to protect it for you. So um, this is one, maybe the major problem of uh, this Tunisian constitution. We, we, we know you better than you, you are, and we just don't want to say it. Democracy is a universal concept, and if Tunisia wants democracy, they maybe have to think about um, the articles of this constitution as universal articles and not uh, Tunisian, African, Muslim, so, poor, mm -hmm. Arabic. So how are you holding their feet to the fire? What exactly are you doing to make sure that they don't get away with it? We are told that the Tunisian women in particular are standing up and saying, Absolutely. no, you won't. Which is a very good thing. Uh, Tunisia is an example uh, on women's rights when you compare it to other Arab countries. But this was because, and exactly how we say it, I quote Tunisians, uh, Bourguiba, uh, which was the, the first president of Tunisia after the colonization, uh, gave us this gift. So it wasn't a battle for women's rights. We explain Tunisia. more for the audience. For the, so, so uh, what yes, in the, about. 50s, in the 50s, when uh, Bourguiba decided to to, to write this um, stage, uh, personal status code, which gives to the woman, to the Tunisian woman, the right to divorce and many rights, but not the equality, the real equality between men and women. But when you compare it to the other Arab countries, we are clearly better than any other Arab country. And uh, today, with this um, so-called moder uh, moderate, moderate Islam, Islam. Uh, Islamist um, uh, party uh, in Nahda, they, they govern us, so they are in the Troika. And they, um, today, we have this new discussion about women's rights. For example, some people want polygamy, which is forbidden in Tunisia, and other, other uh, maybe Islamist laws. So um, the women feel really, I mean, condemned to go out for the first time and ask for, for, for their rights. Because, as I said, the, the women's rights in Tunisia were a gift from Bourguiba to the women uh, in, in my country. So um, it started with this Article 28, the draft of Article 28 that the, the, give the definition of the woman as a, comple a complementary to men. Mm. Women as complementary to men. Yes. I mean, they, they don't have their own existence. Absolutely. And uh, yes, <laughs> in, in the heart of the family. Mm. Uh, and so uh, that shocked many Tunisians. And uh, last August 30, thousands of women went out in Bourguiba, uh, which is the Tahrir Square of Tunisia, Bourguiba Avenue, asking not only to have the same rights that they had before, but to ask for equality, real equality between men and women. And it was, I mean, 
the first time you can see that in the Arab countries. I mean, how do you dare asking for equality in uh, an Arab uh, Muslim country? And so just two days before, uh, in the Constituent Assembly, they changed this draft to, uh, ex uh, to equality between men and women in the Constitution, mm -hmm. and they will vote for I hope. Mr. Minister, remember how uh, Iraqi women also stood up and fought for their freedom and for the democracy in their own countries, and how excited they were with their, you know, fingers uh, yeah. uh, in, in purple color. And, you know, when it came to ruling, you just, like, most of them are kicked out. No. What the heck happens all the time? Why do you On do that? On the contrary. What is this? <laughs> that, that was the purple finger that led others also to... Don't you? <laughs> That's true. That's okay. true. That purple <laughs> finger was really important. But no, then fact, where are no, they? They're no. not really, like, how many of them are there in the government? Yes. How, many, uh, no, how much are they protected by, by, by the laws? 25%. There uh, is the a government? quota in the Iraqi in the parliament. parliament. Yes. Okay? I'm saying in the government. In the government, <laughs> we have a woman minister, we have deputy woman ministers. Out of how we many? Have, Out of how many? We have ambassadors, we have... Uh, Help me out. Out of how many? <laughs> no, no, I think, uh, believe me, uh, the participation of women is much better than many, many other countries. But this is not enough. I mean, the no, problem... No, no, no. It's... But constitutionally, I think we have established women's right. I think... Uh, you have a separation from religion and state. I mean, you, you don't... You, there is a separation between There is, state. yes. There but, is. But is there, going, is there no, any guarantees that you have it in Tunisia? If you want me to be, I mean, frank with you, yeah, I, frank, I will not course. ask you to be to, to give women's um, uh, ministers and uh, deputy ministers and things. Women, Iraqi women, have to stood for this. And this is what I'm calling uh, the Tunisian to do. I mean, for example, uh, what? What is we, we, we do have one uh, minister, one woman minister, and she is the minister of women. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very good. And so um, when I met her, I said, one of the best things you can do is to, um, to resign and to say enough with this ministry. And uh, this is, I mean, th we are in 2012. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, maybe I'm 27 years old and I uh, live too much in, uh, in Europe and uh, all of that stuff. But I can't, I can't accept it for my country. I can't accept today in 2012 to be in my country discussing whether uh, we can have a woman as a minister of justice or something else. I can't imagine today in Tunisia talking with MPs to, <laughs> to tell them that you can define a woman as complementary to a man. It's, it's incredible. It's, it's, just, it's just, I mean, <laughs> incredible for me <laughs> to, to be, yes, because, I mean, I have, I, I have I have an iPhone. I'm connected all the day. <laughs> I, I use internet, and I'm discussing whether or not we should have women in our government, or, or or should we have gender equality in our constitution? It's just crazy. It's not normal that today in 2012, mm -hmm. in our countries, we still think and have panels on this. You see why uh, we at Beirut Institute uh, a new think tank. It's, it's a think tank for the Arab region, looking forward, constructive thinking. See why we are so proud to have people like Amira Yahyawi on the board of advisors. Now, you see that, right? Farah <laughs> Atasi, uh, it, I, I, I can't imagine the pain you feel when you are listening to the assessment, uh, uh, which is not the first time that you hear it. You've been in New York for the last couple of days. But to come from someone as honest as Hoshiar Zibari, uh, and then on the other hand, you walk around uh, Americans, and some of them say to you, "You know, we're now afraid to support you because we heard that Al Qaeda has taken over in your country, as if you have no seculars fighting for, you know, with, with the with the opposition." Well, how do you feel, and what do you do about it? Yeah. 
Thank you, Ragda. And allow me first to thank Beirut Institute and, of course, under the leadership of a very dynamic woman, Ragda, and uh, also the Foreign Policy Association for allowing uh, us to give a picture, the, the facts about the Syrian revolution and to speak to such uh, a nice gathering. And thank you for your patient, uh, Your Excellency, for staying with us, uh, taking the time as well to debate our own perspective about the Syrian revolution. Of course, I'm not here today to um, uh, reveal the facts that I believe uh, almost all of you know about the Syrian revolution. Uh, I don't want to talk about uh, over 30,000 uh, murderers being killed uh, by the forces of the regime, most of them civilians, women and children and elderly. I don't want to talk about millions of refugees along the border with Iraq, with Turkey, and of course, Jordan and Lebanon. I don't want to talk about the rape cases. I don't want to talk about the terrifying stories coming out of Syria. I don't want to talk about the dismay that we feel as a Syrian people to see the international community. As uh, Pan Ki-moon, Secretary General of the uh, United Nations said in his opening remarks at the UN, he said, the whole world shy away and turn their face on the Syrian people. And this is really how we feel. I, I don't want to talk about those facts to you. You see it every day on TV. But I want to challenge those myths that on, and those misconceptions and misinformation about the Syrian revolution, who started the Syrian revolution and who's carrying right now those flames uh, and this fight for our dignity, for freedom, for end of tyranny and dictatorship, like any other, uh, like all other uh, uh, brothers and sisters in the Arab world, beginning from Tunisia and ending in Yemen and Libya and, and Egypt, uh, of course. First of all, I, as a Syrian, am very involved in the, in the Syrian revolution and supporting my people and coming from Homs, uh, where the revolution started and now symbolically we call it, it's the capital of the revolution. Uh, the, uh, the people still use the term Syrian uprising. It is not an uprising. It's a revolution that's been going on for over 18 months. People uh, from day one saying the regime, asking the regime to leave. Erhal, they raised the slogans till now for over 18 months from the north of Syria to the south of Syria, from the east to the west. People are fighting for their dignity. I can't imagine any other terms than revolution to be used than minimizing the sacrifices and the hard working of the Syrian people by calling it an uprising. Another myth that a lot of people say that the regime is fighting uh, an armed group. That's unfair. That's so unfair expression where the term that has been used in Iraq and has been used in uh, uh, Libya, freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. We have freedom fighters in Syria. We don't have armed opposition. We don't have armed group. We don't have political opposition. It's unfair to uh, um, explain the picture of, as if the regime is fighting political groups, political opposition. Those political opposition, and some of them, I, I am an, one of the opposition uh, um, leaders and members, we are just people, ordinary people, politician, experts, technocrats, you name it, who support the revolution, who believe in the revolution, who would like to convey the voice of the revolution to the outside world. But yet we are not the one who's fighting the regime. The freedom fighter inside Syria, those who are fighting the regime and those who are carrying the flame of the revolution. So it's unfair to imagine that it is uh, a war between a regime and, and, and some political opposition. We don't accept that. We're here just to support our people. Another myth which is very important to us that this revolution is somehow dominated by Islamists. I don't know, you have an example here. It is dominated by fanatic. It's dominated about Al-Qaeda influence in Syria. As Raghida mentioned briefly, I think she mentioned very, very important remarks to um, His Excellency Zibari about the more you wait, the more you open the doors for people or for outsiders to intervene and come and hijack extremists, yes. our Syrian revolution. Mm -hmm. This revolution is not carried by Islamists. Some of them, I work with those freedom fighters on the ground. I do Skype with them, I, I work with them, we get all these YouTube pictures, we speak with them. Sometimes I joke with them and I say, you know, if, if they have this little bird and I say, you know, if I put that YouTube, people think, 
you know, like you are a brotherhood, you're Islam. Yes, he said, Farah, I don't have time to shave. We don't have water and, 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 and electricity. We're not really in a, in a very comfortable situation like getting out and mm -hmm. sitting in front yeah. of the mirrors. Seriously, this is, those people are targeted by the regime. Farah, let me ask uh, uh, Minister Zibari this question. At the time when uh, uh, the Americans were still in Iraq, uh, the Syrians made sure to let a lot of Al-Qaeda likes and Al-Qaeda. This is when President Bush said, come on on to Iraq to fight the, the, the Al-Qaeda and the likes, and they did, and a lot of them came from Syria. Did those guys stay there and now they've gone back to sort of take revenge and pay back uh, in Syria? Uh, what is the relationship? And what do you know about the, <coughs> the, the, the um, sort of perception, again, that Farah has spoken about? If, if you talk to American intellectuals these days, they, you would think there is nobody in Syria fighting but the Al-Qaeda. So put this in perspective for us, please. Well, first of all, uh, back in 2009, and even before, Syria was the main regime that supported terrorists infiltrating into Iraq from throughout the region and giving them shelter, access, uh, guidance, and direction. This yes, is training. Uh, training. This is a well-established fact. Uh, I have here one diplomat. Nora, can you stand up? OK. She was badly injured in the ministry, and we were not sure that we can save her life by a two-ton truck bombs that blew up the whole ministry in 2009. Those people were coming from Syria. The regime in Syria, the current regime in Syria allowed exactly. them to cross. It, exactly. It, it was, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank God you're alive. Yes. And <laughs> so really, we have a taste of, of what this regime was doing and what was is capable of. And uh, we in Iraq at the time tried to take Bashar Assad regime to international tribunal court to establish a special court, and you know that. Mm -hmm. We were left alone. Right. Nobody would listen to us. Neither the United States, nor the European, nor the General Secretary, and nobody, as if because there are some certain uh, policies or promises the Syrian at the time gave that they will participate in the Arab-Israeli peace process. So everything was hushed up. Mm -hmm. We met the Syrian delegation recently in one of the regional capital, and they were complaining to us that there is a flow of some jihadists or terrorists coming the other way around from Iraq into Syria. And we responded to them that these were the same people yeah. you sent to Iraq. Now they are back to, to haunt you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But how big? But, but for, no, no. Yeah, but how big? How big is the problem? Because you know, no, I no, get... it is a problem. Yeah. I, I sympathize. I've done your work before, Farah. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you are doing. Mm. We know it more than sympathy. Okay. <laughs> I've, I, of course, I've, I've done your work, uh, and your excellent work. Actually, you are doing to alert people, to synthesize, to uh, to lobby. But at the same time, I was... Uh, but you won. Look no, where no. you are. You got rid of Saddam Hussein. No, no, I know. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, I was in the field also working. I mean, not only in, in mm -hmm. abroad, in Europe, in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a fighter also on the ground. So I know how things are. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very, very important not to be disconnected with... with with what is going on, you see? No matter, I can support you, your cause, that there are no foreigners, there are no fighters, there are, but people 
are there they are trying to hijack this revolution. She did say that. Yeah, yes. but in a very... Okay. No, no. Um, yeah. I will, I will okay. debate that. Challenge but that. These, are, these things are brought by many countries as a reason for no action. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah, but how, no, no. how, how if, much if they form? Our percentage? I know. Give. I know, but even if there are a few cases, but mm -hmm. if there is unwillingness, if there, is, there isn't that will that we spoke mm -hmm. to do something, mm -hmm. there are many, many mm -hmm. reasons, excuses for doing yeah, nothing. Yeah, so. but wait, wait a second. Aren't there some, uh, uh, some uh, Kurdish, uh, Kurdish fighters helping uh, the opposition in Iraq? Kurdish fighters from Iraq hel uh, helping the opposition in Syria? The Bashmirka, I am told no, that there is... A no, in fact, there are nearly 17,000 or maybe 20,000 refugees, uh, army conscripts who fled to the Kurdish region in, in Iraqi Kurdistan in northern Iraq. They are there, they are housed in camps, they are dealt with as refugees, but they have not been armed or rearmed or sent into, into Syria. But... The Kurdish regions also are in uprising with the rest of, of the Syrian mm -hmm. regions, let's say, and they are in control of a uh, large swath of territory. Right. Uh, just, just quickly, I, I mean, it is, it is the perception, again, that the extremists have come to Iraq, sorry, extremists have come back from Iraq into Syria in order to fight the regime and help the opposition. Whereas the fact of the matter, as being stated by Iranian officials, is that Iran is sending arms and, uh, and aid and, and training to the regime that's killing its own people in defiance of a Security Council resolution that prevents Iran from sending such. So it's really interesting that the perception is lopsided, and I don't know whether it's out of ignorance or if it's, if it's intentional. Go may ahead, I because I want to get back that? to... Yeah, okay, please, go may ahead. I clarify that? This is... <laughs> This is, nobody is saying that, uh, uh, you know, maybe few, and you say there are some few uh, cases of maybe some uh, radical uh, fighters in Syria, but those, I would say, they don't compose two or three, if I want to be very pessimistic, 5% of the majority of the Syrian citizens, and I emphasize Syrian citizens, Muslims, Christian, Kurds, Sharkas, Arman, from all from all the, mo the beautiful mosaic of Syria who are within the revolution. And we are not disconnected from the reality because the people who are carrying the revolution, they are our relatives, they are our families, they are technocrats, they are entrepreneurs, they are doctors, they are intellectuals, they are pharmacists. The, the women, like the organization that I chair, we have over 16,000 nurses, only nurses in Syria, who are doing, some of them, uh, students, they, they are in the second or third school years, they are doing surgeries to, to, to uh, uh, help uh, or uh, uh, help the, the wounded people. So the situation actually, like, it's coming out uh, to the outside world that the Islamist is controlling and the jihadist is coming and everything, where the Syrian, uh, the Iranian government said it bluntly, and we are so surprised that nobody reacts to an official statement from the Iranian regime saying last week, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe 10 yes. days ago, he said, we have Iranian revolutionary guards in Lebanon and Syria. Mm -hmm. Full stop. Mm -hmm. Nobody challenged that. We know for sure that we are, if we are a Syrian people, Syrian citizen, because we are fighting for citizenship, we are fighting for, to gain back our citizenship as a Syrian. So if we are fighting the regime alone, and if we are fighting Assad alone, we could get have get rid of him long time ago. It's because of the Iranian support and the Russian and the Chinese alliance with the Iranians, and those are the real front that the Syrian, uh, unfortunately, we are stuck in a very geopolitical and, and, and strategic location that we had to fight us on so many fronts. We have the, the, the Israeli and the Arab complex, we have the Iranians, we have uh, so many issues that we are fighting. But if we are like in Libya or Tunisia or Egypt just fighting a regime like Mubarak or Qazafi, we're not stuck in this location, Assad is no more. To us, he, he, he's gone. We don't even see him. We just want him to leave and leave us in peace and have all Syria reconcile and start build 
our state, the, the, the uh, civil state, the states for all Syrian. However, the Iranian meddling in our issues and this geopolitical and now the Syrian files is out of Syria. It's in the hands of the international players gathering here at the United Nations. And everybody is, you know, unfortunately, the last thing they think about, the sacrifices, the more we wait, maybe that will allow a lot of people to find Syria a nice battle to fight for any reason, for ideological reason, for their own reason, for their political reason. However, this is not the fact. And the more we wait, the more the situation, even Ban Ki-moon said it, again in his remarks at the, at the uh, 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 United Nations, he said that the situation in Syria is not a threat only to the Syrian people because we are losing now daily over 200 people. Those are not numbers. It's really dismaying just to see that the, the names are becoming in the news channel just as if they are unhuman. Those are human beings losing their lives, losing uh, to, for dignity. They deserve more attention from the international community. And this is what Ban Ki-moon said. He summarized it. He said, the situation in Syria is not a threat only to the Syrian people. It's becoming a threat for international security, Jesus, regional yes. security. And I'm quoting him. Yes, and that's exactly. very important. But inaction is not an action. Um, you know, uh, it's always when a uh, conversation goes so well, it's a very sad thing to be forced to end it. So I have a couple of minutes left. And I want to get back to Amira with these couple of minutes. Uh, His, Excellency, His Excellency spoke of the Russians being very worried about the rise of the Islamists to power. This revolution in the Arab world uh, has started in Tunisia, and you have Islamists ruling. Uh, and uh, you know, have maybe I don't know that if there is a monopoly or not, but you also have these are the Muslim Brotherhood in in the front ruling in the front, but you have the Salafis, you know, impacting and demanding and changing things on the ground uh, and in the background. Uh, is this going to be an ongoing battle for a long time that the secularists will lose, or what is? Do you feel that the Russians are exaggerating? No, I think. Um I think it's a good it's a good thing that Nahda won these elections. And why is that? Because we've seen how incompetent they are. We've seen how uh, really we've seen that and I I I want to quote someone but I forget his name he said uh, Islam cannot compete with China. And that's that's exactly what's happening in Tunisia. I mean we've seen that they are as corrupted as the uh, old regime. All their families are ambassadors and, uh, and everything. They have nothing and they know nothing about economy, which means that Tunisia is going really um, bad in economy. And they, they, they were talking about free, uh, um, independence of justice. They are against it. They are against gender equality. They are against freedom of speech. They are against um, independence of, uh, of media, they are against everything. So um, a revolution happened in Tunisia, a, a revolution against Ben Ali, who wanted the same thing as they, mm -hmm. as they do. Now the problem in Tunisia is maybe, I won't say it's the same thing in Syria, but it's um, all this Qatari Saudis interfering in our internal affairs. And this is a huge problem we are facing. For example, when you see how the, the amount of money injected into the Salafist movement in Tunisia, which is, I mean, the somehow the violent uh, uh, branch of, uh, of Nahda, we, we are worried about that. That's, that's one of the hugest problems. But I don't think it's... I don't think Tunisia is in a fight between secular, secular people and Islamists. It's a fight between Tunisians and those who want to export and to import other uh, identities to Tunisia. So, for example, when, when, we, when I told you about the, um, the women's strike uh, this August, August 13th, it wasn't only a uh, woman like me, I mean, in a dress and in the hair. It was veiled women. It was poor women. It was men, poor men. So what did they men. say? What did they get out to they, say? 
it's it's Tunisia. We have we have an already an identity that we had for years and years, and this is what we want. We want a democracy. We want jobs. We want justice. This is what we, we want. Education. We want health. So what? just like anybody else. It's just in the world. like any yes, just exactly just like <laughs> anybody else, and this is the thing. I mean, in Tunisia. The majority, I mean, if we have elections today, the, the Islamists will not have 40% as they had. Actually, they even, uh, we had this, um, this poll just uh, two days before, and they, can, they have 25%. And why is that? Because they've shown to all the Tunisians who voted for them because Islamists are not corrupted. So they showed that Islamists are as corrupted as the others. And the thing is, Maybe Tunisia has this chance to not be in, the, in a very complicated geopolitical um, region and have this chance to, to really don't worry about these problems of identity and all the stuff. So uh, we just want this life that you Americans also want, which is, as I said, job, health, education, and easy life. Normality. 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 With that, let me uh, just say, I think it was fascinating for me to sit uh, in this conversation because as uh, Minister Tibari said, maybe the change started in Iraq and uh, as he insinuated, he was someone uh, in, in the position that Farah Atasi is in right now and uh, in a way also uh, like Amira Yahyawi was. Mm -hmm also before the revolution fighting for rights and civil uh, duties as, as, for, for existence, for, for saying I'm here. Uh, you succeeded, you are a minister for a very long time. You, uh, you know, I mean, uh, we never dreamt that Iraq would have a Kurdish foreign minister and how proud Iraq is to be able to say that they've had not only a Kurdish Foreign Minister, but also a Kurdish president. I think you know you worked very hard, and you arrived, and uh, and I think you worked very hard, and you're still you're, you're the road is ahead of you, but at least some change has happened. Make sure you keep holding their feet to the fire, and uh, Farah, uh, you know, we it is, it, you will. We That's will. it. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.